Welcome to Tabata Talks. I am Tabata, and today I get to talk about Gary Greatness, shining a spotlight on the people who have inspired me, who are from Gary, and they're out making a positive difference in the world. Joining me for this conversation is Brianna Williamson. Welcome, Brianna. How are you? Hi, Tabata, and thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this very just humbling and honoring opportunity. I am so thankful, and I just want to thank you for thinking of me. So important. So thank you. I am so glad to be here with you today. You're welcome. Thank you for saying yes and showing up today. I wanted to celebrate you because I've watched your journey. I've seen your progress. And the sweetest success is when you've worked through the progress and you've arrived at a space where you can say, this is good. It's good in this place. And so it's been beautiful to witness your journey. And so I want to talk about your journey. But first, I know how great you are. Can you tell the people who you are? Who is Brianna? Well, first, I am a Gary, Indiana native born and raised. I am also a mom of four wonderful, amazing sons, and a Gigi of one wonderful, amazing granddaughter. (laughs) And you know, that is how I identify. Beautiful. Now, let's talk about your profession, how you make a positive difference in the world. What is your profession? I am, my profession actually is called a registered respiratory therapist. Um, And would you like me to just give a, a, try to give a brief description of what that is and what I do? Um, So a lot of people may think of a respiratory therapist as someone who, you know, gives breathing treatments. Um, And I do, but respiratory therapists are, responsible for everything from just a basic assessment of someone's respiratory status to actually providing and managing and also sometimes the removal of life supporting devices. Um, The way that most people can identify with it is if you hear, hey, so-and-so is in the hospital and they're on life support, they're on a ventilator. Um, My job is to know that ventilator inside and out. I manage that ventilator. I decide when a patient needs to go on. I decide when a patient can start to wean off. Um, So that is my machine. So my job has a wide range of modalities and therapeutics that I have to go through on and really on a daily basis, right? Um, And so I serve every patient population from neonatal, which is the newborn, all the way up to geriatrics. So uh, yeah, I have pretty much had experience doing it all and it's my life's joy so part of my life's joy second to my family so so what you're saying is you're like a lifesaver in human form um yeah yeah I'd like to say because if you've ever heard of a cold blue right um when unfortunately someone loses their you know ability to maintain vital signs. Um, I am the airway in that situation. So my job is to breathe for the patient and to do that adequately. So. Wow. So we are one year and let's see, we are one year and seven months into what was labeled a pandemic and you're still standing. And so I want to say I celebrate you, and I am proud of you for that. 
Um, I want to say thank you for continuing to show up at work, literally on the front line. I want to know who or what has inspired you to keep showing up during the year that was 2020 and now 2021. So I will say as hard as it is, um, because I've said this before, it's literally the weirdest time of my career. And I'm coming up on 15 years as a respiratory therapist. Um, And if I had to just answer quickly why I keep showing up is because I believe that we truly throughout our lives in one way or the other, always get an opportunity to walk out our faith in God. And with that, um, with me understanding that, that at some time it comes down to, you can not only just say how much faith you have in God, you have to be able to at some point put some action behind that. Um, I don't believe that it's a mistake that I was called into this profession. Um, 25 years ago, when I feel like my life started as an adult, if someone told me I'd be doing these things, I would look at them like they were crazy. (laughs) Um, But it is, number one, it's caused me to this may sound weird, but it's the best way I can describe it. It's just to be able to show God that I trust him for who he is. Um, but I also think I'm able to think outside of myself and my own family and say, I continue to show up for my patients. I continue to show up for the people that, you know, may have a child or, you know, even father or mother who just needs my help, right? So those were, I show up for God first. Um, And then another way that I was challenged to think about it is this. Um, Sometimes when you walk into a patient's room, you you are there to do a job, right? You have a job to do. Um, I work as if I'm working for the Lord all the time. Um, But in the pandemic, it was easy at times for me to forget that like when I get there to forget that because I have to be safe. I have to be careful in the room, right? Um, But I was challenged to think about it this way. Even if I'm keeping my distance from the patient, sometimes if I breathe a word of encouragement in that room, that's all the encouragement they got that day. I remember that there were times that maybe something I said really helped that patient just to get through that day. You know what I mean? So I just try to keep that in mind as well. So I heard you mention so many things. I want to talk about what did you do to discover joy on those days where you had to be or chose to be, if you will, encouragement for the patients? Where did you reveal your joy? Well, let me be quite honest about that question. So that uh, there were times when I went and worked a 12 hour shift. And to be quite honest, I did not find that joy during a 12 hour shift. Sometimes there's so much going on. Um, you, you're used to working really hard and making a difference. And in some situations, um, I may have worked as hard as I could, but I still felt like, we lost, right? Um, So sometimes the joy is really hard to find. The joy may not, I may go a whole day and the joy may not come that day. It may not come until the next morning. It may not come until the next morning when I say, when I wake up and say, you know what? I gotta do it again, Lord. I thank you for keeping me through that. And sometimes I don't see that joy until the next morning, but it's always found in, in God. It's always found in remembering the blessing that I am able to get back up and go in there again. Some clinicians contracted this horrible disease and, you know, had to be off sick. Some clinicians contracted this horrible disease and were not able to overcome, right? 
So sometimes the joy just came from me remembering um, that God is my protector and he walks with me every day. Um, but I'm human. So sometimes I see so much um, at work that I, I, I don't necessarily forget, but it's hard to keep it in the forefront. And that going back to find that joy only happens with, um, you know, prayer and, you know, just giving thanks to God. The profession that you're in now, who or what inspired you to choose the profession or did it choose you? How'd that work? So I think it was a little bit of both. Um, It certainly felt like it was in the universe Um, because I actually, my oldest son um, was a NICU baby, right? He turned 25 this year. However, I remember that experience like it was yesterday, right? I remember what it was like to be a NICU mom, right? And so I always tell people this, if I get the chance to share with them, and now that I work with children, I do share with the parents sometimes that I was a mom. I was where you are, you know what I mean? Um, seeing my baby hooked up to all these machines and lines and loud beeping noises. And I don't know what it means. Um, So unfortunately, when my son, he was released from the hospital, he was only in there for about a week or eight days. Um, But I remember the person that made me the most comfortable about his condition was the respiratory therapist. It was not the doctor. I mean, they were great, but it was, it was not the doctor. It was not the nurse. It was the respiratory therapist. Um, and so my son, he developed in his young age, um, what they call mild bronchospasms, where he suffered with like asthma, like symptoms until he was probably about two years old. So at that time, I thought, if you can understand something, you can control it. Right. So that is what made me want to become a respiratory therapist. Um, But I'll admit there was a period of my life where I lived and I operated in a lot of self-doubt. And when I went to see what the requirements were and I like read some of like the course descriptions and, you know, the requirements, I couldn't even pronounce (laughs) some of the stuff that I was reading, right? So I was like, "Mm, this is not for me. Um, But then I had another person to come to me. He was actually my landlord later on down the line, a few years later to say, you know, I'm a respiratory therapist. You're very smart. You're driven. You work hard. You know, you could do this job and you can make X amount of dollars. You're worth much more than what you're getting paid at the job that you're on now. Like you're, you know, you're really strong. I believe you could do this job. You should do it. And I'm like, yeah, a few more years go by. And I ended up moving away from Gary in about, for the first time in about 2001, but just down the road to Michigan City, right? And I always tell people this, I was working, cleaning hotel rooms at the Blue Chip Casino at the time. And let's just say some things happened that I was over it, right? And I looked, um, I decided, you know, I remember looking at myself in the mirror of one of those rooms and saying, God, this cannot be the life you have for me. I mean, I cannot even afford to stay in one of these rooms if I want to. Um, There's got to be better. So the very next day, I went up to Ivy Tech Community College in Michigan City. And the first brochure I saw was for respiratory (laughs) Something said, this might be it. That's your chosen. You You have been chosen. Yes, I I think so. I think it was my calling, you know, to just at least to get me where I am. It definitely was part of God's plan, right? So 
Here I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for answering the call, Rihanna. So let's talk about growing up in Gary, Indiana. Some call it GI. 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 <laughs> what are your happiest memories growing up in Gary? So my happiest memories, even though I lived in a few different areas of the city, I spent most of my years in Glen Park. We moved over to the east side of Glen Park when I was in second grade. I stayed on 40th and Kentucky. <laughs> and we had, and anybody who knows that area, there was a park right on 39th in Kentucky called Howe Park. What I remember is just the community. So many kids everybody loving on each other. It was a time when the, the block was full of kids. Um, we could walk around to our friends' houses blocks away and not have much to worry about, right? Um, the dads in the community, like on those two streets, used to get all the boys in the neighborhood together, take them over in the park and play softball every Saturday morning. There was a tennis court, there was a pool. We would go there and literally spend all day, right? Just playing and just, we just had the freedom of playing. We were in a time where people still believed in a village raising children. You had your neighbors who, would chastise you if they needed to and take you home and let your parents, then your parents would chastise you, right? Um, I remember just being a friend of everybody. I, I didn't, I don't remember really having enemies and it was just such a different time, you know? And I, I always used to tell my boys when they were smaller, I would be like, get out and get outside and play. You put that game down, get on that bike and, you know, go play. Because that's what I remembered as a kid. Um, school was amazing. The teachers, I loved school. Um, and I just, I just enjoyed growing up you know, and my neighborhood and all the community. That, that is what I remember. If I could go back to a time, it would be that time. Okay. I heard you say schools. What schools, Rihanna, did you attend? So I actually, again, remember I said we moved up until second grade and we kind of stayed put. Elementary school, I went to Vor. <laughs> I went to Aetna Elementary. Um, but then when we moved to to uh, Glen Park, I went to Riley Elementary School and then on to Bailey. And then I thought I was gonna go to Luales with all of my friends, right? And I did it. I went and had auditioned at Emerson VPA, Visual and Performing Arts. And I had totally forgot about it until the letter came that I was accepted. Even at a young age, I think that I operated in a lot of self-doubt. So even when I went and did the audition, I'm thinking, ah, oh, they're not going to let me in this school. This school is for the rich kids. You know, it's not, they're not going to let me in this school. And I remember thinking, oh, we were going to go and pick out our schedule. I was going to walk up to the Wallace with my friends. I was all, my clothes were all ironed. I was all excited. I was going to school with all of my friends from the neighborhood. And my mom was like, nope showing me the letter. <laughs> so I ended up at Emerson and another like very wonderful and fulfilling experience. And when I ended up at Emerson, I can say now with confidence, that is where I needed to be. That is the setting I needed to be in. What did you audition for? I know this is going to come as a shock but it was drama. <laughs> drama was my. <laughs> so a tad bit early start in the drama department, just a little bit. bit early start, being dramatic. Wow. 
So I was a drama major at Emerson all four years. I graduated in 1996 from Emerson VPA. Amazing. So drama got you in the door. It got me in the door. You know what it did for me, Tavetta? I think, you know, you think of the arts as they're just you doing the thing that you have grown to be good at doing um but it really was a way being on that stage it was a way to build confidence um which is something that I definitely struggled with Uh, sometimes I still struggle with it today um but it was a way for me to build confidence um and it was also a way for me to see the potential in myself um you know what I mean um because you I started off even in that time, not really thinking I could do it, right? Um, But I could, and I did. And there were times, I remember I had a a theater teacher, his name was Mr. Her, Mr. Robert Her, love him. And he, I remember him saying to me one time after we had been auditioning, what we had been practicing for a scene of a play we were going to do. And, you know, he came to me in the back with, you know, everybody was in the back and he's like, Brianna, you know, I really want to see you do your best with this. I, I believe this is your craft. This is your art. You know, he said that scene really picked up when you came out there and I'm just really, really proud of you. And those are words that was probably 1993. <laughs> and I still remember that today. I still remember how it made me feel you know, um, when it comes to building confidence. So. Wow. That's beautiful. Almost some years later, that (laughs) is phenomenal. So you are living proof of the greatness that exists. What would you say to someone who may ask the question? Does greatness really come from Gary, Indiana? I would say absolutely. I would say greatness comes from anywhere. Um, There is nowhere on this earth that God does not go. There is nowhere on this earth that you could be living that God has not thought of you. But I think it is the mindset, right? It's the mindset that people, you know, tend to be in. And when you change that, you know, you don't have to leave Gary to be great. I was blessed to be able to, um, you know, get out, get my kids out and everything. That's just something that I wanted for my, for my family, right? Um, I wanted to be able to expose them to different areas, right? I didn't want them to be like me. Um, I did not leave Gary, Indiana t- for any reason to visit, even to visit until I was a 21 year old woman. And I didn't want that for my children. I wanted to broaden their horizons, but you don't have to leave Gary to understand and know and realize that you are great, right? So absolutely greatness comes from Gary. Greatness is in Gary. Greatness will come to Gary. All of those things, right? We, you know, you think of people like um, Michael Jackson and all of those, you know, people, the, 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 the people that they, you know, are stars and stuff. But um, I think it's the smaller people that make, you know, an even bigger impact. You know what I mean? The people who don't get the recognition on that level. Right. Um, but absolutely. Greatness comes from Gary. Um I believe that I am great. I believe I have the potential to be greater. Um, And yeah, I came from Gary, born and raised. It's part of your story, right? It's it's what makes you. Um, So I'm not ashamed of anything. Um, I love to share my story. Some people, when they hear of how I lived coming up, like they they can't even believe it, can't even imagine, right? Right. Um, but it's who made me who I am today. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for it. Well, Brianna, I am thankful for you. I 
appreciate you. I thank you for your time. I thank you for all that you do. I pray that the rest of your life will be the absolute best of your life. I thank God for continuing to cover you, to protect you, and to order your steps as you show up every day to answer the call, to take care of his children. Thank you for being the lifesaver in human form on (laughs) earth. And I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Love you. Love you too.